Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Duality 9Xers around the world. Welcome back to another exciting edition right here on Duality 9X, where we separate fact from fiction. But real or fake, well, that's a decision you need to make. So I've got a great video today. I'm going to feature the lost city of gold, El Dorado. This has captivated my interest, my imagination for, for so long. I mean, ever since I was a little young kid, um, the topic of treasure, gold, the lost city, you know, deep in the South American jungles. Um, it there, there's a there's a special kind of an intrigue, you know, um, a mystery that surrounds it. And unfortunately, there's not a lot that's out there on social media, uh, ironically, about about this. But there's a lot about uh, the ancient, you know, the Incas and 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 you know the connection potentially between Egyptians. And, and the people here in the Americas uh, and, of course, the indigenous tribes that, that used to live in that area. Um, and I featured that in one of my earlier videos. But uh, it's, it, it's absolutely mind-blowing, you know, to think that there were individuals who had lit literally mountains and mountains of gold. There was one individual in particular, an ancient uh, Incan leader, who had so much gold that he would bathe himself in gold dust. So he would always adorn himself in gold. And that's why the people around him uh, used to refer to him as El Dorado. Um, and El Dorado essentially means the golden one. So really interesting stuff. Um, again, this is just kind of like a snippet of, of things that I was able to find. And then another video by a, a, a YouTuber that, uh, you know, the links to his description and his channel is all going to be there. Uh, I want you to check him out. He does a lot of great work. And um, yeah, I think this is going to be really fun. So without further ado, guys, let's get it. Hey guys, so I'm, I'm going to show you guys a video uh, that was uh, made by a gentleman by the name of Sam Sinha. Now he's a YouTube content creator. Uh, he, he has some pretty fascinating stuff and he did an amazing job in, in kind of delving, doing a deep dive into this story of El Dorado. So I, I wanted to kind of feature him. And um, so definitely the links, you know, if you if, if you want to check them out, the links to the original video and just, you know, will be in the description along with this YouTube channel. Uh, definitely check them out. Subscribe to them. Um, I think he did a wonderful job here. And so I want to show you guys what, uh, you know, his perspective on, on what's going on here. So let's go. A few decades ago, we didn't have quick access to satellite maps. Despite wide explorations, we still had some fantasies, some mysteries, some legends. The lost Atlantis, the Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti. But the real life is not so interesting. The fact that the supernatural doesn't exist is disheartening. But human beings, being human beings, didn't give up. And perhaps that's why a mythical city in the South Americas attracted explorers for almost 400 years. A mythical city of gold that was rumored to be there but always out of reach. El Dorado, the city of gold located somewhere in South America. A legend that permeated through centuries, led to plunder, disappointment, claimed lives, and yet continues to remain an enigma that never was. It's never been found. Does it even exist? No, probably not. No evidence at all. For the last couple of months, something triggered my interest in El Dorado again. I mean, I'm always interested in this kind of mythical stuff, even though I don't believe in these things. I even cosplayed a fictional character. Absolutely embarrassing. Anyway, so while looking at the history of this legend, I came across this map of South America. Here's a lake called Parime and near that we have something called Manoa or El Dorado. And this is not the only map depicting El Dorado. In fact, there are many such maps. All showing the location of El Dorado near a lake called Parima. The weird thing is, if you look at that place in the actual satellite images, there is no such lake. 
Lake Parime, a lake this size doesn't even exist. But why? These were not random people. They were cartographers, geographers, explorers. They knew what they were doing and they all decided to draw a lake that doesn't even exist. What? So, you know, th this is fascinating, guys. Um, here's, here's an individual who didn't, who, who didn't necessarily or doesn't necessarily believe in, in the unknown, right? The, the mysteries and all the cool things that captivate our interest and imagination on a day-to-day -day basis. But something intrigued him about this story where he had to do a little bit more fact-finding, you know? So as he started to do a deep dive into this, he started to unravel some maps, uh, old maps from, you know, you know, old historians and cartographers and, you know, people who specifically had a skill set in creating these maps. Now, why is it that their maps show this lake? Clearly on the map, you could see it looks like a lake. And it's not just a small, tiny pond. This is a lake, a big lake. And apparently things have come out of this lake, lots of gold. Um, but why is it that you don't see it in a lot of the, the modern maps? Doesn't even look like it existed. Does, it doesn't even seem like it was there. So this kind of adds to the whole myth and mystery surrounding this lost city of gold. And I put an emphasis on lost because it just very well may be lost or purposely hidden what is going on is it like there had been a lake that dried up and if so why is it always connected to this mythical city of el dorado manoa where is manoa i had to get to the bottom of the story and what unfolded is a story of a legend that survived centuries inviting explorers in droves a myth that appeared as a country rich in emeralds and gold, an enduring myth that can be explained not by mankind's inherent power of imagination, but by the material condition of the time and place that gave birth to this legend. Okay, so the story starts in the 15th century, 1400 to 1500, almost 500 years ago. European explorers, cartographers, suddenly found out there exists another continent outside of what they knew of, something that the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci referred to as Mundus Novus, aka the New World. Till now, European explorers had the knowledge of, well, of course, Europe, Asia, and Africa, the old world. And now, all of a sudden, they came to know about a whole new continent, a whole new continent, new opportunities for explorations and exploitation. Spanish explorers too started visiting the new continent and there they came across, well, they came across a lot of things, natural resources, fruits, culture, land, but there was one more thing that sounded kind of enticing. It's this ritual of the Muisca people. The Zipa, the chief of the Muisca, wait, so the Muisca at that time was a group of indigenous people of Colombia. The descendants of this group are still part of the current population. The Spanish conquered them around oh, wow. 1537. Anyway, back to the story. The Spanish came across this ritual of the Muisca people. When a new chief of the Muisca people is appointed, he's taken on a raft to the middle of Lake Guadavira. The chief, naked, is covered with gold dust and others too, and then they throw the gold dust into the lake, offering that to their god. And not just gold, but tunios. Tunios were small artifacts made of gold and kind of like a gold, copper, silver alloy sometimes. So basically the gold stuff gets deposited at the lake and the new chief is sworn in. This is the ritual of gold. And this is the ritual that the Spanish people heard of. And they were like, okay, there's gold involved. And they could easily believe the story because this wasn't simply a rumor. 
Another guy, a Spanish, recounted his experience. Till now, El Dorado was a ritual, the name of a ritual, not a city. But here, from this point onwards, it's going to be a city. And the culprit behind this new myth? A Spanish captain working under a Spanish adventurer, Diego de Ordaz, Juan Martinez. Juan Martinez claimed that he was taken into a city called Manoa by the locals. He claimed to have lived there for seven months and the emperor of the city, Inga, gifted him with lots and lots and lots of gold. After all, it's a city of gold. And then Martinez uh, decided to return to his homeland while returning uh, near the Orinoco River, he was robbed. This is the story that transformed El Dorado from a ritual to a mythical city. But wait. Um, wow. Uh, you know, to, to think, imagine, imagine stumbling upon a whole new civilization, a whole new world of people that you've never, ever seen before. Just imagine for the indigenous tribes that were living in that area to come, you know, to come face to face with people that they've never seen before, wearing different kinds of garments and clothing. They looked different. The color of their skin was different. The way they spoke was different. That in itself was probably just shocking to them, you know, and 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 then for these for these visitors, for the Spanish uh, conquistadors, you know, coming into this land where they're starting to see all these new customs and rituals and including like just the ways, the ways that these indigenous people were living were obviously a lot different from anything that they've been privy to. But then they started to see the things that started to captivate their greed, their hunger, their passion and I don't know what it is about jewelry guys but it makes people go bonkers now imagine walking into a place where all you see is gold the streets are paved with gold the buildings are adorned with gold inside the walls and everything within those places of residences and temples are adorned with gold right to the fabrics that people are wearing are gold this incan leader um was put on a raft and went into this lake where he was just had nothing but gold dust on him absolutely incredible folks let's get back to the story did everyone believe martinez's story I mean, the dude could have lied, right? Well, thing is, that region is full of rich stuff. Yucca, coca, and quinoa were not the only stuff that this region provided to the European explorers. They also found emeralds, salt, copper, and gold. Of course, gold. The Spanish conquest of the Inca was happening in the meantime, and they found a lot of gold. Gold, gold, gold. And the old Quimbaya artifacts found in this region is a living testimony to how much gold was available. And this is where Juan Martinez narrates his adventure, his experience. And the others were like, wait. I just want to back it up, guys. The Inca was happening in the meantime. And they found a lot of gold. Gold, gold, gold. And the old Quimbaya artifacts found in this region is a living testimony. Right here. You see these uh, ornaments of gold that they found in that period, that time? Guys, this looks like something that you would find in today's, in, in any of the modern boutiques that you find in stores, right? I mean, the shapes of this, what does that look like to you? Doesn't that look like a plane to you? They look like little planes right so where who came, like i mean the the people who crafted this gold into this ornament where did like where did you get the inspiration to create these kind of objects is it possible is it possible that they may have seen an aircraft thousands of years ago 
Hmm. To how much gold was available. And this is where Juan Martinez narrates his adventure, his experience. And the others were like, wait a second. This could actually be true because we have already found gold near this region. So there has to be more gold here. I mean, there has to be a lot more gold here. More and more, more explorers gold. start venturing out into the wild to find this mythical city. A lake somewhere and a golden city near the lake. But wait, the Spanish were not the only people trying to find Manoa. Here comes the British. And when I say the British, I mean this guy, Sir Walter Raleigh. And this is where things get really interesting. <laughs> Walter Raleigh was a British <laughs> soldier, explorer, and many other things. In the Battle of Flores, which happened in 1592, his role was instrumental in leading the English Navy towards making the war a financial success. Huge deal. So the Queen Elizabeth I was very much impressed by Raleigh. And here, Raleigh came across Juan Martinez's story in a weird way. The Spanish governor of Patagonia basically blurted out that story to Raleigh. At that time, this sort of geographical information, navigational information, used to be kept secret. But well, he blurted that secret out to Raleigh. And Raleigh was like, okay, let's talk about that later. But then he did some other stuff and got imprisoned. So he wanted to gain his prestige back. And what's a better way to do that than to find the mythical city of gold, El Dorado? So Raleigh's expedition starts in 1594. He captures Trinidad and its Spanish governor, Antonio de Barrio. He collects as much information as he can from Barrio and starts venturing further. Remember Lake Perime, which was like a huge lake that was supposed to be near the city of gold Manoa or El Dorado? This map from 1598 kind of makes way for it. Here, look, before this, there was this map by Raleigh himself that depicts a lake with Manoa, the mythical city, and many map makers started copying this lake Perime into their maps. So, a Dutch map, an English map, a Dutch map, another Dutch map, a Czech map, a French map, another French map, a Dutch copy of a French map, it's everywhere. And the people producing these maps were great cartographers and explorers of that time. And they all decided to include a lake in their maps that they didn't even verify. A lake that probably didn't even exist. Wow, back in the days, good old fake news. Okay, so Raleigh fails to find Lake Perime and El Dorado. He returns to his homeland and everyone is disappointed. And they were like, Raleigh, didn't you say you'll bring all that gold from the mythical city of El Dorado? Where is all that? Where is all that gold? I mean, this is so underwhelming, dude. In the meantime, Elizabeth I died and King James became the new king. Raleigh got imprisoned on the charges of conspiring against James I. While he's in jail, his son is born and another big thing happens. The end of the 19 year long Anglo-Spanish War. The English and the Spanish sign a treaty, the Treaty of London. In the meantime, few others try to find El Dorado and of course fail. But then in 1617, Raleigh gets pardoned by the king. He's released from prison. He wanted to search for El Dorado one more time. But remember, there was a treaty signed between the English and the Spanish while Raleigh was in jail. So, the king gave Raleigh one condition. No matter what you do, don't get into a fight with the Spanish. Like, dude, you are released. You can go out and try to find your fantasy land. That's absolutely okay. But, remember, don't get into any kind of fight you have one with rule. the Spanish. One rule. Remember that. He goes back on another voyage to find El Dorado, this time with his son and his long-trusted captain, Camus. And guess what he did? He got into a fight with the Spanish. Like, dude, you of had course. only one thing to one avoid. Job. And that's exactly <laughs> what you did. Although it's not really reasonable for us to blame Raleigh for this. 
He stayed back at Trinidad and instructed Camus not to get into any kind of conflict with the Spanish. And Camus got into a fight with the Spanish here. And Raleigh's son got killed in this fight. Damn, how is Camus going to tell Raleigh all these? I mean, one, he got into a fight with the Spanish, violating the condition on which Raleigh was released from the prison. So, so if he goes back to his homeland and tells the king that they got into a fight with the Spanish, the king is going to execute him. And second, Raleigh's own son got killed in the fight. A fight that wasn't even needed. Heck, finding El Dorado itself wasn't even needed. And they couldn't find it anyway. So Camus gives this news to Raleigh and kind of, you know, asks for forgiveness. Which of course Raleigh couldn't give him. I mean, his son got killed. What do you expect? Also, Raleigh's death sentence was suspended before. What's going to happen when he goes back and says, you know what, we got into a fight with the Spanish. Camus was like, okay. And then by taking responsibility, he took his own life. By this point, the, the myth of El Dorado has already taken ships, settlements and lives. When Walter Raleigh returned to his homeland, he was executed. Such a long story of chasing something that doesn't even exist. Just like the hair strands I had here. They're not there anymore. They are non-existent. Just like El Dorado. Damn. Eventually, everyone got to know that this lake doesn't exist, nor does El Dorado. German geographer Alexander Humboldt confirmed in the early 19th century that Lake Perime doesn't exist. The seasonal flooding of local rivers probably gave rise to the legend of the mythical lake and the mythical city. And that's how it ended. Some might say it all was the result of a single person's obsession with a fascinating story that he heard from a dubious source. But deep down, it's not a single man. It's not a single explorer whose interest in the subject made hmm. two empires collide, triggering numerous expeditions that yielded nothing. It was more than one person. It was the age of colonial endeavors. Ideas for explorations were getting generated, but not from thin air. I Ideas come from the material conditions of the time. The material conditions of the time provoked explorers to venture out and find resources. Because that's what they needed to build empires. This obsession with finding treasures and mythical cities full of gold is not simply a character trait of explorers of that time. It was a result of the material conditions that were slowly shaping the world, the effects of which we still feel today through the dialectics of ideas and material. And in that way, El Dorado was found, not in some mythical city, but in the politics, the geopolitics of that tumultuous period that shaped world history. <sighs> All right, see you tumultuous in the next video. Period. Thank you. Definitely was a tumultuous period. That was fantastic. I think Sam did an amazing job by piecing a lot of that stuff together. Um, he is uh, and remains to be a skeptic. Um, and you can't blame him. Uh, there's, yeah, there's, I mean, there's plenty of stories of people like, you know, uh, Mr. Raleigh from the UK who, who ventured all the way down to South America in hopes and aspirations of finding this lost city of gold. Now, was it a dubious source that provided them this information? Um, one can only wonder, right? But there were so many like him. He wasn't the only one. There were people from all over Europe and perhaps maybe all over the world that were still not 100% sure exactly as to who these individuals are, but slowly by slowly, they're, they're starting to come out of the woodwork. But what a sad demise for for Mr. Raleigh and, and you know, to lose his son and eventually... You know, he lost his life, and then the person that he traveled with, you know, committed suicide. You know, it's just such a tragic, tragic tale of events. And these are the kind of stories that you hear often about stuff that um, happens uh, with a lot of would-be treasure hunters like him and others who fell to the same kind of fate, unfortunately. Um, all in the efforts and hopes of finding the shiny piece of metal that we called gold. Now, 
all this time it could have been right underneath their noses. Is it possible that Lake Paremi doesn't exist? It's quite possible. But why is it that it was in all these maps? Now, I get it. You know, somebody said, you know, that it was there. And based on that, he created a map and then other people, you know, copycatted that map. And then they made maps based on, you know, based on those original maps without maybe doing fact finding themselves. But but I, I beg to wonder, is it possible that that place did exist? And maybe it wasn't like a real lake. Maybe it was, you know, exaggerated in terms of how big it actually was. Maybe it was a little bit smaller. Um, perhaps, perhaps this lake was again it dried up during certain periods of the time and then it turned into water maybe there was flash floods that would happen every now and then and then a certain area would would be covered with water and then that's what would give rise to this possibility that there was a lake and then in the dry season it would just go right you know the the water would dissipate back into the ground and it'd just be a dry bed that's quite possible and it's quite possible that there was something there and maybe the authorities and, and, you know, people in our modern area or several hundred years ago decided we got to cover this up and we got to move the contents of, of, you know, all this precious metals and emeralds and everything to another secret area um, far away, far away from mankind and far away from, from people not local to the area to alleviate from them getting robbed. Now, that's a possibility as well. Jewels and stones. Is this where the Incans fled to with their gold when the conquistadors invaded? If so, they would have had to leave the country. The myth of El Dorado is not tied to Peru. To find its true origin, we must head north to Colombia, because it is there that the legend of the Gilded Man comes from. The legend is connected with the ceremony that took place on Lake Guatavita, 30 miles east of Bogota, the modern capital. Hey guys, this is a really important part. So this is where they're going to talk about, the, you know, how the, the, the phrase El Dorado was actually coined and what that actually refers to. And so there's a lot of reference to the gilded one, the golden one. What, like, what exactly does that mean? So this is very important. I want you guys to pay attention to this. Colombia. After the Spaniards heard the story of the king, covered in gold dust and jewels, and throwing gold into the deep water. It is easy to understand why they thought the bottom of the lake might be covered with years of discarded treasures. Scholars wondered for a long time about the origin of the myth and the ceremony. And in 1954, Colombian archaeologists gave an explanation that seemed plausible. Their research showed that thousands of years ago, in a period when man already lived in the Andean Cordilleras, or mountains, a great meteorite fell from the sky. The Indians would have heard a deafening blast and seen a streaking gold mass with a trail of gold light behind it. Those who witnessed this phenomenon probably thought some powerful god had arrived on Earth. Archaeologists believe the reason the Kachike, or chief of the Muisca tribe, covered himself with gold dust and took ritual baths in the sacred waters was in honor of this event. But the origin of the ceremony was not the only mystery. Where would the Muisca have gotten that much gold to dispose of in the first wow. place? It is known that only the tribes of the hot and humid tropical lowlands, called Tierra Caliente, this is a great video by Josh Holmes. Um, he kind of puts things into perspective. It's a big video. Gold, We're not going to play everything here. The ultimate here. symbol of money standards. and riches. As far back as ancient Egypt, artists used the precious metal to create masterpieces for their pharaohs, like the famous burial mask of Tutankhamun. The ancient Romans also had a passion for gold. After every military conquest, their armies would bring home as much of the revered substance as they could carry. At the end of the reign of Emperor Augustus in 14 AD, the gold reserve of the Roman Empire had reached 14,000 tons. 
By the year 1500, this lust for gold took on a violent streak in many European nations. The Spanish sent full armies across the sea to Central and South America in search of gold and treasures. The Spanish warriors were called conquistadors, and they were ruthless in their warring tactics, most of the time taking no prisoners. Artists and writers were sometimes present on these journeys to record the tragic events. In just a few years, Spanish troops led by General Francisco Pizarro managed to wipe out entire ancient civilizations like the Incas. Who were the Incas? Their origins are lost in antiquity. But according to a modern theory, like all pre-Columbian populations, the Incas were descendants of migratory movements from Asia across the Bering Strait that occurred 40,000 years ago Absolutely. when a thick ice cap Absolutely connected the... Absolutely incredible. So there's definitely, you know, a, a, you know, obviously a lot of these indigenous people local to their lands, you know, they, they traveled thousands and thousands of miles just to get to where they are. They weren't always there, right? So there was these land bridges that connected, you know, like uh, North America and, and Asia and Europe at one time, you know, during the Ice Age and even prior to the Ice Age. And that's how people kind of migrated back and forth. and artifacts from other nations, which were ruled by the Incan Empire. Builders, and more or less defenseless, unprepared for a... To find its true origin, we must head north. To Pichu play at the time of the Gulls and Gold. All right, gold. so let's, uh, let me pick it up from here. Makeup. Many of these treasures are on display at the Gold Museum in Lima, Peru. Here we can feast upon the beauty. But we're also forced to recall the unbridled passion that drove men to commit hideous crimes of murder and theft. The museum contains many jewels of Inca civilization, like this ceremonial shirt made with 13,000 gold wow. foils, and artifacts from other nations, which were ruled by the Incan Empire. Wow, look at all that gold. The Spanish were amazed at the way Cuzco's buildings were put together. Even today, you can get an idea of the Inca's building skills, thanks to the so-called stone with 12 corners. Many different stones are locked into other stones without using lime or cement. They were laid with such precision that not even the blade of a knife could wow. pass between them. That's incredible. And just how did these people do it with primitive technology and tools? We can see how the Spanish conquistadors must have been in awe when they discovered one of the most important and sacred places in the Incan Empire. A place filled with gold statues and works of art that would make any museum proud today. But instead of preserving these beautiful artifacts, many of the most magnificent treasures of humanity were lost for all time. The Spaniards melted much of the work to make gold pesos to send back to Spain. The fate was no better for the inhabitants of Cusco. They were farmers and builders and more or less defenseless, unprepared for a brutal enemy like the conquistadors. They were almost all massacred. 
as the Spaniards tortured and brutalized them to get them to reveal where the king hid his gold. The Spanish were convinced that the Incas stashed away most of their treasures in cities hidden in the mountains. One of these cities remained unknown for centuries and was discovered only in 1911 by American historian Hiram Bingham. It was the lost city of Machu Picchu. Its discovery raised a number of questions. What role did Machu Picchu play at the time of the conquistadors? Why hadn't the Spanish found it? And was it really the last refuge of the Incas? So far, there is no definite answer to these questions. It's a, it's a mystery. Machu Picchu is a huge mystery, folks. To some archaeologists, Machu Picchu was a defensive outpost that was built to prevent hostile nations from entering Cusco through the Sacred Valley. To others, it was a place of worship, the seat of the virgins of the sun god. A temple there is dedicated to him. The temple may also have been used as an astronomical observatory. It was as close to the sky as you could get. Today, you can still see the Intihuatana, or the hitching post of the sun, a sort of sundial. It's believed that the Spaniards never reached this city. But how could they have missed such a big place? Some archaeologists believe that it was so well hidden and dates so far back that Incas living around there at the time the Spaniards arrived didn't even know about it. Machu Picchu may have already been abandoned and buried in the jungle at the time of the conquistadors. Wow, that's just so fascinating. A city all to itself above the sky. One thing we do know, Machu Picchu, even with its veil of mystery, is not the legendary land of El Dorado. So where was El Dorado, the famous kingdom of gold? A city with walls covered in gold leaf and parks that had trees and flowers made of gold. The city of every man's dream, rich beyond imagination in precious jewels and stones. Is this where the Incans fled to with their gold when the conquistadors invaded? If so, they would have had to leave the country. The myth of El Dorado is not tied to Peru. To find its true origin, we must head north to Colombia, because it is there that the legend of the Gilded Man comes from. The legend is connected with the ceremony that took place on Lake I Guatavita. Pay attention to this, folks, because the legend of the Gilded Man, also known as the Golden One, it's absolutely shocking. But now you'll start to get a sense and an understanding in terms of how. Uh, the word El Dorado and what it means actually represents to the to the locals and the indigenous folks that used to live there. But um, this will kind of put things into perspective a little bit. 30 miles east of Bogota, the modern capital of Colombia. After the Spaniards heard the story of the king covered in gold dust and jewels and throwing gold into the deep water, it is easy to understand why they thought the bottom of the lake might be covered with years of discarded treasures. Scholars wondered for a long time about the origin of the myth and the ceremony. And in 1954, Colombian archaeologists gave an explanation that seemed plausible. Their research showed that thousands of years ago, in a period when man already lived in the Andean Cordilleras, or mountains, a great meteorite wow. fell from the sky. The Indians would have heard a deafening blast and seen a streaking gold mass with a trail of gold light Imagine behind it. Raining gold, Those like who witnessed raining this gold. phenomenon probably thought some powerful god had arrived on Earth. Archaeologists believe the reason the Kachike, or chief of the Muisca tribe, covered himself with gold dust and took ritual baths in the sacred waters was in honor of this event. But the origin of the ceremony was not the only mystery. Where would the Muisca have gotten that much gold to dispose of in the first place? It is known that only the tribes of the hot and humid tropical lowlands, called Tierra Caliente, had rich gold mines, 
There is no sign of the precious metal anywhere on the Bogota Plateau where the Muisca lived. So how could this pre-Columbian people possess so much gold that they could throw away heaps of it into a cold lake? The mystery was unraveled thanks to the discovery of mines located in the mountains west of Bogota. The mines date from the period of the Muisca and contain rock salt, the same salt we use for cooking. At the time, it was so scarce a mineral that it was worth more than gold wow. to pre-Columbian peoples. The Muisca used to sell the cakes of salt all over Colombia, making a good profit. It was from this resourceful merchandising that the Muisca were able to buy the metal with the golden reflections. And their skillful craftsmen could then turn this wonderful substance into a thousand marvelous shapes. We can now still admire these precious objects in an extraordinary collection at the Gold Museum in Bogota. With the opening of the museum in 1939, Colombia was able to stop the flow of national treasures across its borders and keep its artistic heritage intact. The museum features mummies and beautifully crafted gold artifacts of the Muisca, along with other tribes who knew how to work gold, like the Sinu, known for their fan-shaped pendants, the Tolima and the Quimbaya, whose craftsmen created a variety of beautiful objects, and the Kalima, who made big breastplates, tiaras and brooches. With all this beauty, we wonder who actually wore the jewels. Was it just the leaders or warriors? Or did women also covet and wear this jewelry as they might do today? Studies of this period have shown that women never wore jewels, only priests and dignitaries. Jewelry had strong ritual and religious values. The fantastic figures evoked supernatural characters that they believed could influence life on earth. The masks placed on the faces of the dead were meant to prolong life after death. The small, highly stylized depictions of animals, especially birds, were offered as gifts to the gods to increase the fertility of the soil and to guarantee bountiful harvests. Some of these incredible jewels are shrouded in a little mystery. Scholars believe that they have a perfectly streamlined shape that only a modern engineer who designs airplanes could conceive. How could they have been made more than a thousand years ago? Many golden objects used by a nobleman or a priest when he was alive accompany his mummy after death. They were placed inside hypogeum tombs, which meant that they were dug under the ground. The corpse was placed in the tomb along with jewels and everyday objects to make the soul's journey to the underworld more comfortable. Many jewels were offered as gifts to the gods. Wow. One of them is considered a masterpiece. It is a raft made of gold and emerald for the Cachique of Guatavita, which was accidentally discovered in 1969 by some farmers in a cave Look near Bogota. The man seated on the throne is El Dorado, the gilded man waiting to emerge into the sacred water of the lake to obtain divine powers. Also in the scene are some men who are throwing gold offerings wow. into the lake. Most likely they are priests and dignitaries who were escorting the king. So are there treasures then buried in the waters of Lake Guatavita? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Since the time of the Spaniards, thousands of men have dived under the water trying to find the gold. Some even tried to drain the lake, but there was never enough gold found to make it worth their while. So what happened? The museum also houses jewels of the Tyrona, another ancient people of Colombia so what, who have... What happened? Where did all this gold, supposedly, where did that all this gold go? Were there rations and rations and tons of uh, all this gold just happened to be like somewhere in the bottom of the lake? Well, clearly it looks like it's not because thousands of people have already. And I mean, if you've been thinking about this, if you're watching this video and you're like, hmm, maybe I need to make a trip out to Colombia 
and go to uh, go to this lake to see if that gold is actually there. Chances are there's probably nothing there. So interesting. Um, what happened to it? And so now you understand where the term El Dorado comes from. It was a phrase that was given to the leader uh, of this tribe. And it was known as El Dorado also means the golden one, the gilded one, because he was co like continuously adorned in gold. He dressed in gold and everywhere he went, it seems like the people that were around him would basically throw gold around him and discard it, you know, as a as a means to to showcase his royalty, his presence and his affiliation with that substance that was very near and dear to their hearts. Very interesting. The church and convent of Santo Domingo are representative of what happened here. They were erected on top of the ancient Temple of the Sun, the Corin Concha, or Golden Enclosure, Three, the most important two, temple one. at Cusco. Unfortunately, not much remains of its past splendor, except for a few retaining walls and some terracing. When it was new, however, the Temple of the Sun covered a square that was 1,300 feet long on each side. It included a golden garden and the wow. Sun Pampa, with life-size golden statues used depicting flowers, plants, and animals. Its walls were covered in 700 gold leaves, each wow. weighing four pounds. And inside, there were magnificent treasures including royal mummies dressed in colorful costumes, covered in jewels and gold makeup. Many of these treasures are on display at the Gold Museum in Lima, Peru. Here we can feast upon the beauty. But we're also forced to recall the unbridled passion that drove men to commit hideous crimes of murder and theft. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very sad what people did to acquire the substance, how many people died. The museum contains many jewels of Inca civilization, like this ceremonial shirt made with 13,000 gold foils, and artifacts from other nations which were ruled by the Incan Empire. The Spanish were amazed at the way Cuzco's buildings were put together. Even today, you can get an idea of the Inca's building skills, thanks to the so-called stone with 12 corners. Many different stones are locked into other stones without using lime or cement. Unbelievable. They were laid with such precision that not even the blade of a knife could pass between them. No mortar, no nothing. Unbelievable. It's just like Lego. We can see how the Spanish conquistadors must have been in awe when they discovered one of the most important and sacred places in the Incan Empire. A place filled with gold statues and works of art that would make any museum proud today. But instead of preserving these beautiful artifacts, many of the most magnificent treasures of humanity were lost for all time. Wow, look at these temples adorned with gold, gold leaf. And he said that some of these, uh, the, the leaves itself are about four pounds a piece. The Spaniards melted much of the work to make gold pesos to send back to Spain. The fate was no better for the inhabitants of Cusco. They were farmers and builders and more or less defenseless, unprepared for a brutal enemy like the conquistadors. They were almost all massacred as the Spaniards tortured and brutalized them to get them to reveal where the king hid his gold. The Spanish were convinced that the Incas stashed away most of their treasures in cities hidden in the mountains. For El Dorado was devastating for the indigenous native populations trying to advance their cultures. 
It was more than unfortunate that they fell victim to men driven by a savage lust for wealth. Although El Dorado has never been found, the search goes on today. The gold objects and jewels that have survived these ancient civilizations still inspire modern-day Indiana Jones types to hack their way through the jungles of South America in search of this lost city of men's dreams. El Dorado, the legend, continues. Wow, that's absolutely incredible, guys. I mean, the story continues to go on. You know, there's so many different towns, or, well, towns, I mean, back then, there's so many different uh, areas and regions, you know, villages, you know, there's uh, even Machu Picchu, which, uh, you know, obviously there's um, some significance there as well, too. Absolutely mind-blowing. It's incredible to think that there's so much mystery that continues to surround and shroud this area. Um, I'm almost beginning to think if there is some documented evidence somewhere to support everything that we're seeing, everything that we're privy to, because there has to be. But I think it's safeguarded and it's kept under wraps only for a very few people, maybe a few groups to know about, because this information potentially, it could be quite dangerous in the event that it gets out of the wrong hands, right? I mean, perhaps maybe there's a huge, huge stash of gold somewhere hidden away, um, and only few people might know of its location and where it's actually stored. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible. This this story continues to, to just shock me and surprise me every time because more and more truths are coming out as we know it. All right, guys. Well, we have a few more clips that I want to show you some different takes and perspectives on, on the subject matter. Is El Dorado actually a real place? It was indeed real, but not in the way you might think. In ancient South America, great civilizations such as the Inca and Muisca thrived, with El Dorado playing a significant role in their cultural narrative. Contrary to popular belief, El Dorado was not a city teeming with gold, but rather a ceremony performed by the Muisca people. This fascinating ritual involved their leader covering himself in gold dust and diving into Lake Guadavida, while onlookers cast precious stones and gold into the water. As tales of this legendary golden city reached European shores, explorers became obsessed with the idea of finding it. This fixation led to numerous expeditions and even conflicts between those in search of El Dorado's riches. Interestingly, many gold artifacts unearthed in modern-day Colombia can be traced back to the same Muisca people who performed the El Dorado ceremony. While the city itself remains shrouded in mystery, the legend is undeniably rooted in a real and captivating ancient tradition. Although many still continue to ask the question, Wow, it seems like the Muisca people had a treasure trove of gold, almost like as if it was an unlimited supply. And not just gold, rubies, emeralds, precious gemstones. And their gold pretty much touched all corners of South America and I'm sure pretty much all over the world as well too. Absolutely insane. In the depths of the South American jungle lies a legend so alluring that it has driven explorers mad with desire for centuries. It is the legend of El Dorado, the lost city of gold. As the story goes, El Dorado was a city made entirely of gold with its streets paved in the precious metal and its buildings adorned with glittering jewels. Legend has it that the city was so wealthy that its inhabitants would use gold and silver for everyday objects such as plates and utensils. Expeditions were launched, treasure hunters scoured the jungle, and countless lives were lost in the search for El Dorado. But the city remained elusive and its whereabouts remains a mystery to this day. So what became of El Dorado? Did it ever truly exist? The truth is no one knows for sure. Some say El Dorado was never real, that it was merely a myth that became so powerful it captured the imagination of people all over the world. But for others, the legend of El Dorado remains a tantalizing dream of unimaginable wealth just waiting to be discovered. So, in the depths of the South American... Tale of in the heart of South America lies an enigmatic tale of El Dorado, the fabled lost city of gold that has captivated explorers and historians for centuries. Legends speak of a city adorned in gold, where streets were paved with precious metals and treasures beyond imagination awaited. 
Spanish conquistadors eagerly sought this mythical city, believing it to be the key to immense wealth. Countless expeditions ventured into the dense jungles of the Amazon, facing treacherous terrains and indigenous tribes in pursuit of El Dorado. Despite their relentless quests, El Dorado remained elusive, becoming a symbol of unattainable riches and the allure of the unknown. The legend of El Dorado continues to spark curiosity and imagination, blending history with folklore in a tantalizing narrative of greed, ambition, and the eternal quest for hidden treasures. The legendary El Dorado, meaning the Golden One, is a legendary city of gold said to exist in the heart of South America. The tale of El Dorado dates back to the 16th century, when Spanish conquistadors first heard of a native South American ruler who covered himself in gold dust and would dive into a lake of gold as part of a religious ceremony. Over time, the legend of El Dorado evolved into that of a city made entirely of gold, and countless explorers set out to find it, hoping to claim its riches. Despite many expeditions and searches, the city of El Dorado has never been definitively found and remains a mystery to this day. The legend of El Dorado continues to captivate people's imagination, inspiring stories and adventures. Whether it is a city of gold or simply a myth, the tale of El Dorado remains one of the greatest treasure hunts in history. El Dorado Spanish Con The Lost City of Gold said to be located somewhere in the depths of South America's thick rainforests. According to legend, the Lost City, also known as El Dorado, was created as a refuge for the Inca civilization when they were raided by the Spanish conquistadors led by Francisco Ponzaro. It is said that many of the Incas had brought with them large amounts of gold, silver, and artifacts to El Dorado to hide from the Spaniards. El Dorado's discovery has captivated the imagination of explorers for centuries. In fact, the search for the lost city has been the subject of expeditions in which numerous people have unfortunately died in the process. While no direct evidence of El Dorado has been found, the stories and legends of the city continue to captivate audiences around the world. Which leaves us the question, will anybody ever find continue El Dorado? Did you ever heard about the legendary city of El Dorado? It's not just any ordinary city. It's believed to be a place overflowing with gold, hidden deep within the jungles of South America. Picture this as daring adventurers, explorers, and treasure hunters risking it all to uncover this mythical treasure trove. Back during the Spanish colonization of the Americas, everyone was talking about it. The tales were wild, with indigenous tribes performing elaborate ceremonies involving gold, adding to the mystery and allure of El Dorado. But here's the kicker. Despite countless expeditions and tales of discovery, El Dorado remained hidden like a puzzle waiting to be solved. The hunt for gold is a passion that has driven centuries of conquests. Deep in the Amazon is rumored a lost city endowed with riches, the city of El Dorado. For 500 years, captains and archaeologists have journeyed through the Americas in search of this city. Some say it doesn't exist, while others believe it's cursed and destroyed. What then is the truth about El Dorado? In the 15th century, Spain amassed tons of gold from South America alone, making it one of the most powerful nations. It is believed that a proportion of that gold was found in the Lake Guatavita, where the local chief known as El Dorado the Gilded One sacrificed gold. The Spanish reasoned that if that much gold was in the lake, then the inhabitants must have had a place where they mined and stored the gold. Maps have been found that lead to a location believed to be the city of gold. Expeditions to find the lost city have proven futile. However, who's to say that the treasure has not already been looted? You know, that's, uh, that, that's the thing, right? I mean, so many expeditions have just fallen flat on its face, you know, to no avail. Um, so many people, so many countless lives have been lost. So many people have tried. They've gone to great lengths. They've been backed financially. They had so much money backing them from their governments, from their, from the rulers, the kings, the you know, from from where they were, from Europe. And I mean, again, countless expeditions have just completely fallen flat. Why? Is it possible that the gold was already looted? Is it possible that a lot of this gold that we talk about is pretty much all over the place? I mean, if you go to Spain, a lot of that gold 
um, has already made it into a lot of the churches and cathedrals uh, in Spain. When you walk in, there's like grand displays of gold, ink and gold all over the place. So it's quite possible a majority of it has already been looted. Wow. Mystery. It's shrouded in ambiguity. There is so much uh, about this place that just has captivated the hearts and imagination of people all around the world, treasure hunters, historians, you know, people who have an invested interest, you know, in this particular topic, and just people like you and I, who love mystery, who love the unknown, you know, but when it comes to a good treasure hunt, I mean, I don't think there's anyone on this planet that would say no to partaking in such an event. Um, is it real? Is it fake? Well, you guys know that's a decision you need to make. Well, guys, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, I I hope you guys like this topic. Um, I I love I love this topic. I mean, just the lost city of gold. You know, just just that to to think that there's a place out there, and I truly believe that there is a huge hoard of gold somewhere somewhere in the jungles of South America, perhaps one of these lost cities, maybe it's at the bottom of the lake, maybe it's just at the footbed of a, an ancient Incan or Mayan temple, who knows, but it's definitely there. Somebody at some point is going to come across this treasure trove of gold and it's going to be one of the biggest stories in history when that happens so i can't wait for that in the meantime we'll continue to pump out as much more content as it's relevant to this topic and and it's not just el dorado there's there's lots of different places where there's a lost city of gold there's places in peru in the andes uh you know in egypt and then of course the connection between ancient egypt and south america and and the indigenous tribes that that were in south america i mean it goes on and on and on so it's absolutely incredible i can't wait to share more of this with you but that's it so i hope you guys had a good one and until uh our next adventure and in the meantime and in between time just relax guys don't do anything crazy to yourself and i look forward to catching you guys on the next adventure. Have a good one.